Hello, today I'd like to talk about my favorite Rift and Greater Rift solo farming builds for Monk in Season 22. Alright, so for Rifts, I'm once again using LOD Wave of Light, but with a couple changes compared to normal. So I'm doing Legacy of Dreams, but with the Shadow Clones part of the theme, you're actually able to pull off a cane swap pretty regularly. Like, I don't know if it's half the time or less, and half of the time that it is possible, I just forget to do it. But it's a thing that you can do if you know you already have a clone in the boss spawns. You just really quickly... Well, when you don't have the cube open, you really quickly right-click them all, and you've got them all equipped. The boss dies, right-click them all, and you've got your normal LOD set back. Um, I will say, if you are using Gloves of Worship, because originally I was doing this with Mage Fist, um, and so I crafted Kane's Gloves, and if you're using Gloves of Worship, all of a sudden you lose those shrines that you have going for 10 minutes. So I would craft the other three items. There's four different Kane's pieces. If you're not using Ring of Royal Grandeur, you have to wear three of them to get the full bonuses. So craft the helm, the pants, and the boots. It doesn't matter what the rolls are because you're not going to kill anything uh, if you got an LOD build and then you throw on Kane's pieces. Um, so anyway, just going over the rest of the stuff. Incense Torch, very good. Uh, I like Nemesis Bracers, especially on any Injiam build because that's more opportunities to get Injiam up time. Ever span for Mega Pickup. Early season, definitely like Stone of Jordan because it gives you a bunch of elite damage as well as some elemental damage. Later, you might s just wear Avarice Band here and then add in Flavor of Time as uh, or any other jewelry piece that you want there. Um, since you're basically invincible the whole time, I just go with Emeralds, particularly early. But later in the season, maybe if I feel like being lazier, uh, since I'll have enough extra decks from Paragon easily... Um, I might swap those to diamonds just so that if I do drop gold, it's not an issue. Uh, speaking of gold, we got the Avarice, or, or uh, we got the Boon of the Hoarder and the Gold Wrap combo. Avarice Band helps as far as vacuuming up that gold, but as far as the infinite toughness, it basically comes out just these two items. Um, when you combine that with Wildebeest Gizzard, you always have Squirts up time. So if you're not trying to play around uh, Squirt's bonus, uh, you could just wear it for the gold find, but it would be down most of the time. Even though you're not taking any real damage, you're still taking some damage with like billions and billions of armor. But with the Wildebeest Gizzard, even if it's only level 25, you never take any damage because that small shield will always be enough to negate it. Again, these are my three favorite fists for this build. Is uh, Normally I would just have Injam and... Kairoshiro's Blade, but with this season we can throw in Rabbit Strike. If you do feel like you're so powerful you don't even need all three of these, maybe you could swap one for uh, Echoing Fury and that would give you more attack speed, which would probably lead to even faster movement. So right now we've got the three charges of Dashing Strike, which with an Injion build, I really like it. Um, a little bit of extra attack speed from this mantra. Invincibility, this is helpful at the beginning of the rift. You have four whole seconds that you can be invincible before you've picked up any gold. You can also use it on floor changes or any other time that you think you might actually be vulnerable. I usually do it when I do that cane swap just as an extra layer of security. Uh, I go with Desert Shroud. If you've got Cinder Coat, you don't need any more RCR really, although I think I got it. Yeah, I got it on these shoulders. I don't have it on the Obsidian Ring. I am considering swapping Cinder Coat for a Gold Wrap to get even more gold because I keep running out as I run. Like, you can run higher greater rifts this season than normal solo, and I, I'm running out of gold, even running all of my puzzle rings. So, right now, I've got 22,000 gold find on this. I could get, like, just won't roll one of my other Cinder Coats to gold find, but I might just wait until I get an ancient gold wrap and try that. Um, as far as, like, how many of my rolls are ancient and such, I gonna have a d3 planner in the description but got ancient ancient non-ancient ancient ancient non-ancient ancient ancient non-ancient non-ancient ancient 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 so that was about one in three are still non-ancients uh, i got lucky and i've had two swampland waiters drop without playing witch doctor and the first one happened to come with 20 fire so i just rolled it to dex um if you have everything um if everything's ancient except for one slot, that final slot only gives you like an extra, I want to say it's like 4% with LOD overall damage multiplier because you have, you already, yeah, because you have 25 out of 26 potential uh, LOD stacks because it's like 
with LON, it was 13 potential stacks of the multiplier. Um, but here it's like twice as much for ancients and one amount for non ancients. So I like to think of it as 26 stacks of it. So if you're at 25 of 26, adding the 26th thing would only give you 125th more damage or 4% more damage. So really, like this is way better than just having an ancient pair of pants. Uh, that doesn't have 20% fire damage because that even with lots of other fire damage rolls, that's going to give you more than 4% damage. But the fewer uh, the fewer ancients you have, the more each new ancient will do. The first ancient, like if you had no legendaries at all, for instance, the first one would give you 375% more damage, which is pretty insane, but it diminishes the more you get. Passives... I'm going for more damage, more attack speed, which also equals damage, but also better dashing. More cooldown, which is good for if Injiam is down, and then cheat death. All right, so let's just see what a run goes like. My low latency game, which I like to look for if I'm going to be doing a lot of Injiam play on Monk. So we hit our Serenity. We've got four seconds of invulnerability, but it doesn't matter because it took us like one second to get gold. And then we pretty much like just dash a few screens attack a few things, dash a few screens, attack a few things. That looks like it might have been the way over to the other half of this jail. But if you got a nice open map, the rabid strike and just the explosive light hitting the whole screen kills things really fast. And then uh, if you stand there, kill them, and then dash through it, that can give you a lot of the gold picked up compared to if things are dying behind you with some of the more spin to winny builds. So that's another reason that I really like a build like this for Torment Farming, is just to pick up more of the gold that you see. And we're almost at Vinjiam, so this is like one of the worst moments you can have on a Wave of Light Monk. Because I've routed this place really weird. <laughs> Usually it doesn't take too long to come across another Elite or another Shrine. There's an Elite. So I'm going to take that hallway now. And since I haven't had any shrines, I might not be able to show the cane swap. Maybe I'll just do a few more runs after this and cut that into the video, what it looks like with the cane swap. Yeah, no shrines yet, so bad luck on that one. Usually if you got one floor, it, it makes it a lot more likely that you'll have a clone for the boss. But when there's no shrines, there's no shrines. All right, so this should be a good example because we're over halfway through. We just got to this floor and there's a shrine. So we should be able to cane swap on the boss very easily. If you find a shrine at the very, very, very beginning, there's a chance that like it might take over a minute to clear uh, a floor if it's a giant floor and bad density for some reason. So I have had like one time that I tried to cane swap on a floor where I find the pylon at the beginning and it didn't work. But now clone just kills this guy. Boom. We got our three keys because, you know, you only have a 25% chance on each one of getting more keys. <clears throat> I had a goblin pack at the beginning of this one, so we are very full. All right, next up we have the very standard Tempest Rush farm build that I use for... This is what I use for the bulk of my farming. Uh, it's what I've used in past seasons, just adding in the Mantle of Channeling. So with that extra toughness of the Mantle of Channeling, we were able to do it with the Squirts version a lot earlier. This build revolves... Uh, around trying not to take any damage to yourself by having it all go into the shield. If your shield is dropping often and you're losing squirts, then it's going to be a really slow, inefficient. So you can either be on a lower difficulty where you kill things fast or um, just have a lot more toughness that helps with shields. So if you look at items and you're comparing toughness and you see a giant plus toughness, it could just be more vitality or life, which will not help you kill faster. You want things like... Uh, elite damage reduction or armor or life per second. You don't want much for vitality or um, percent life on your gear. Ideally, you get single res and those other things I'm talking about and decks on a lot of this stuff in the middle here. Uh, all res is a little bit worse. I just didn't really prioritize getting really good Captain Crimson stuff. So that's still an all res roll. But something here where I have uh, the life regen which helps your shield be bigger because it's increased based on your life per second from will to beast the armor and the dex gives you more armor so like all that stuff keeps your shields happier 
uh, rolling this vitality to armor would probably be an even better version of this chest. And I try and get a whole bunch of cooldown so that I'm just able to dash as frequently as I'd like. Cooldown and crits are the by far the most important rolls that you can get on gear. Uh, average damage is good on a ring, of course. In this case, uh, 95 to 199 average. Um, resource cost reduction and area damage. Kind of, I'll take either one of those after I've gotten things like crits and R uh, and enough CDR. So here I've got 10% RCR. Here I have 10% RCR. And what that does with Captain Crimson's is every one of those 10% rolls gives you 10% more damage reduction. So that's pretty handy for, again, never dropping squirts. But with the mantle of channeling in this build, once I get fully ogged, now I'm mostly ogged. Um, I think I ogged. Oh, I actually didn't save it in this version of the build. So, all right. So the good news is uh, I didn't save these armory builds with uh, my new helm. But I, it's also like the D3 planners were saved with the old helm. So I'm just going to do these examples with the one that's in the D3 planner, which is my non-ancient that I had been using. So this is a 105. We got... Defense, like the max defense you can have, dashing strike, the max defense you can have, mantra. Uh, doesn't matter on the room because you get all runes of sweeping wind. I just always take inner storm from my Sunwuko days. Defensive epiphany, wall of wind, that procs Caesar's memento. You have to hit him with a blind freeze or a stun. Everything is constantly getting frozen with this. So always have Caesar's uptime. And then flurry is by far the most powerful version of Tempest Rush. So if you're all if you're wanting to do some kind of super speed farm thing, you don't need that extra damage. But if you're GR grinding for XP, you could always use more damage because you could always just raise it a few levels if you're killing instantly, and then you could take advantage of the fact that you have a rune that deals more damage. So we are gonna be playing around, trying to keep our squirts up and killing like everything. So it's not really an elite farming build. I'm gonna open the door just because I like to open doors. Although you do want to kill every elite, but you also kill most of the trash you pass through, right? Because as long as you're Tempest rushing into things, you're cooling down your dash and everything else like via your obsidian ring. So I like to just sit on things until they all get pulled in and I pop them with force move. And I'm just hitting the space bar. That's like the quickest way to activate, uh, to drop your Tempest Rush stacks. You could just uh, release it and then re-click it in my case, because I got on right click. Or you could cast Cyclone Strike, and that's also pretty quick. But I feel like just very, very quickly, or I'm gonna tab it. That was so quick, I don't, I don't think he even lost stride compared to casting a skill. So I always just tap force move to drop my stacks on enemies. And I do it like all the time. So actually, uh, earlier this week, playing this build so much, my thumb was starting to hurt because that's what I hit spacebar with. It's nice to have a clone for the boss, but definitely not mandatory. This boss, uh, this build is pretty amazing at killing bosses. They get frozen pretty much until they're dead, so even the dangerous ones aren't an issue. And this is without stricken, it's just with the squirts and the damage of the flurry. <coughs> So nothing too scary dangerous, particularly when you already have a power pile on. I could be dashing like freely and looking for the next elite, but I like to just mow everything down. You might think like, wow, you're not moving very fast. This could be a slow rift. But if you look at the bar right now, <laughs> like that hourglass is still near the beginning. And I've basically just been like cruising at the normal drifting speed of this. You do get 15% extra movement speed for... Uh, Sweeping wind on justice with just three stacks and you also get 25% anytime you have your echoing fury stacks up But in general like most of the extra movement I get out of this is from frequent dashing strike So you might notice I didn't dash through there to get to this boss I just drifted and that's because I don't want to lose my stacks early I usually am saving them up a little bit before I spawn the boss and then have them saved up already for the boss so that was 2 minutes and 18 seconds, 105. Really, um, when I put back on that Og Helm, I'm probably ready for 106s by now. But yeah, this is what I'm using. Right now it's on 105s. You might also notice this tiny, tiny health pool. Uh, 397,000. And yet, things never really hurt you. 
if they do hurt you, then you're going to drop squirts and not deal much damage. So you should try and always play on difficulty where you kill things before they have a chance to hurt you that much. And therefore you keep your squirts up and keep doing amazingly. Echoing Fury I use because of mostly for the 75% bonus attack speed. And this build scales with attack speed, which will come into play on this next build. Normally, without the Mantle of Channeling, this is what I'd use for farming. With the Mantle of Channeling, it's a lot easier to keep squirts up, and I, it's enough damage for a, over a tier higher. So that's really nice this season. But normally, just swapping out Nems for Mantle of Channeling is what I do when I try and do a few tiers higher. So now, since I already have Mantle of Channeling, what do you add? Well, I thought about adding Furnace or Lefebvre's, but I went with... Flying Dragon, and I put a video on the about this um, on the PTR, but I'm definitely still doing it in this season. So I do have a little bit more vitality just because my Caesars actually have a vitality roll on them, but again, I will not be taking much, if any, damage. Chance to double your attack speed when attacking, and that does hit a 5 attacks per second cap, so actually with the Uzi Initiative, with Echoing Fury, you can easily have over 2.5 attacks per second, and then some of this gets wasted. So I actually like to drop CZ Initiative for Relentless Assault. I was using a variation of this build on Saturday already to... F I think I pushed up to 113 or 114, and that was at the time rank 1 Saturday night. Um, was just basically playing this farm build, and I added in Stricken, and I probably dropped Squirts for Flavor of Time. Um... And it's just really nice. But it's very nice for farming because when you're pushing, you don't have very much Echoing Fury uptime, which leads to not very much Flying Dragon uptime, which means it's just bad. So this is definitely better for some kind of speed farm. Right now, I think it's a, almost five tiers better. Obviously, double attack speed should only be about five tiers. But since it's not up all the time, I think four tiers is a nice kill everything pretty fast Uh zone so right now i'm calling this one like a three and a half minute farm build the other one about two and a half minute on average farm build and part of that is from the slightly slower kill speed but a lot of that is just not having nems so that's like 15 percent extra i have to find every rift compared to if you have nemesis bracers and every pylon pops out an elite so this is a 109 right now and probably have like six augs at the moment. I've only got 14,000 dexterity. And anytime you see this near 9 million, that means Flying Dragon is up. <clears throat> really good damage. And as you can see, it's up quite a bit. <laughs> but now I can't really uh, see much other than that, so I'm going to put it back down. But yeah, we're just like mowing through stuff. This is a. I just noticed I'm on a really amazing floor, though. So this one might even be sub-3 if I wasn't, you know, looking at stats and such. This one definitely had sub-3 potential with the power pylon on the amazing floor. But usually these are closer to 4 minutes, like 3.45 or so, but sometimes they are under 3. Never had any be much over 4, if over 4, actually, when I was farming yesterday. Yeah, this is that additional flying dragon damage and a little bit ago I had my stats open. I do that on every boss. I always open the stats back up because one, there's nothing to like scope out. There's nothing to scout when you're just sitting there fighting a boss. But if you like have 50 stacks of flurry saved up and then you use them when you're dealing half the damage you could have been doing, that's quite a waste. So I always make sure that I've got the higher number when I release at least the bigger sets of stacks. After that, it doesn't really matter. And since this build doesn't use Seize the Initiative, I don't need to try and one-shot the boss or even come close to it because at any given time, I'm doing the same amount of damage. The only time I do more is if they're an adds boss and I can get some Echoing Fury and Oculus as well. Then it would make sense to try and save stacks to throw into those. But other than that, it's just like, anytime Flying Dragon's up, it's a good time to spend your stacks all right we could have a clone for the boss as well that does save quite a bit of time too uh probably not though because that's the exit <laughs> another beautiful mob type 
Nine million damage. No! I do have a clone for the boss. Caught on film. <clears throat> so, right now it was at 2.8, now it's at 5.8, basically. That's because I don't have Echoing Fury here. Now I have a little bit, and now he's dead. Oh, it was sub 3, I'm sure, technically. So on the boss, the number here is going to be a lot lower than during the rift for the reason that you don't have Echoing Fury. But you still just want to look for whatever it is when it's doubled. And easy, easy boss kills. As long as you're not trying to go too high where it takes like a minute to kill the boss. Because then they won't be perma CC'd. So let's see. Bam. <laughs> Amazing rift. Sub 3, 109. <clears throat> 14,000 decks. Okay, one other faster riff build that you might see me do. <clears throat> I'm just taking the 105 build and taking blinding speed and throwing over to wave the falling star, which doesn't really move increase your like movement speed much, but I'm also going to drop it a bunch of tiers so I like instantly kill things a lot easier. So, even faster kill speed. If you get an annoying elite, they'll still die fast. If Squirts falls, drops off, you'll still have as much damage as you would in the 105 with Squirts. So it's just like a really chill is just drop it a few tiers and go with the Way of the Falling Star for more movement speed. So hopefully these ones finish in about two minutes. Although I think in practice, they, they end up being about the same speed as the 105s. So this is definitely not a more efficient build, but just something you might see me doing sometimes is Doing a little bit faster, just easier, relaxed farming. Because doing the exact same farm build for hours and hours at a time does get boring regardless of how much you enjoy the build. So that is why sometimes you'll see me doing like five tiers lower than I normally farm with this. Sometimes they'll be five tiers higher than I normally farm with the Flying Dragon version. And as long as I don't <clears throat> go into Molten, I don't really ever proc on any of them. Right now I have a shield pile on, so it should be fine. Ooh, battlefields. Not good mobs, but oh well. Yeah, just wrecking every elite. Not even having to really think about anything. And I suppose around this tier is when you might consider just doing Lightning Tempest Rush as well. but you still do get a lot of extra damage out of the pops. So every elite dies faster with uh, Flurry. The Rift Guardian dies faster, but if faster means like half a second instead of one second, I don't think most people would even notice. There's a Rift Guardian, and I've been saving stacks for a bit, so I got like 30. Boom, dead. Sub 2. Hunted visions with poison. Wow. <clears throat> to the guy who's not playing any Necro this season.